This video is brought to you by News Voice. The news is broken. Almost all US media is owned by just a handful of big corporations. Fake news is obviously a huge problem as well, and finding something unbiased can be really hard. News Voice is revolutionizing the news landscape. It's an app that gives you a personalized news feed by aggregating major news sites, as well as international and independent media, giving some much needed balance. Each news story shows multiple sources, which are all tagged with their bias and perspective. The news affects almost everything in our lives. What we hear and read shapes which persons we trust, what we eat, what we buy, how we vote, and even how how we think. News Voice is created by its readers, as you can upvote stories that you find interesting so more people will see them. It's essentially a democratized platform for news. Plus, it saves you time. You get all the news and all the sources in one app so that you can be better informed. Oh, and it's totally free. Anyway, get started with News Voice today for free through the link below. It's available on both Google Play and the Apple App Store. And let's get into the video. There are places whose size doesn't do them justice. Take Singapore, for example. Despite being relatively small, it is a gigantic economic hub at a regional and even global level. A huge center of economic activity that not only attracts capital and business, but also a lot of workers, most of whom come from Malaysia. And it is precisely in the latter country, Malaysia, where, right next to the border of Singapore, a fierce project was launched in 2006. The construction, from scratch, of an entire city plans to have at least 700,000 inhabitants and located on four artificial islands, that is, on land reclaimed from the sea. We are talking about Forest City, one of the most ambitious and surprising projects to be found right now anywhere in the world. However, if you are faithful followers of visual politic, you will know that building new cities as if they were Lego projects is nothing unusual. What's more, it actually makes a lot of sense. After all, our world is becoming more and more urban. We live more and more on a planet of cities, and the numbers don't lie. For example, about 56% of the world's population now live in urban areas, but that's nothing compared to what's to come. By 2050, this percentage is expected to increase to almost 70%. And as you can imagine, this trend presents a huge challenge. The cities that already exist have their limits in terms of resources, space, services, or infrastructure capacity. In other words, they cannot keep expanding without limits. And that is why in many parts of the world where urbanization is happening faster than in Europe and North America, the solution is to build new cities completely from scratch. New municipalities called to operate more efficiently and achieve better economic performance. And this is precisely what the Forest City Project aims to do. But wait a moment, because the case of this macro project is a little bit different. Its location has been chosen exclusively because of the existence of Singapore. That is, as if it were a whole Malaysian expansion of the city-state. Friends, in this video, we are going to tell you all the details about Forest City, a project as unusual as it is controversial, in which, surprise, surprise, China, yes, China has its stamp all over it. Would you like to travel with us to this corner of the world and get to know not only the wonders, but also the most controversial controversial side of this new city and these types of macro projects in general? Well, let's get started. A Singaporean dormitory or a Chinese colony? Look at this image for a moment. As you can see, practically all the continental territory north of Forest City is empty. And I'm sure there are many of you who are asking yourselves right now, why spend a fortune creating artificial islands and reclaiming land from the sea instead of building the project on the mainland on existing territory in Johor State? Well, because the idea is this. You see, to create the Dream City, a new model of urban development that is a shining example to the whole world and draws the attention of investors, there cannot be any possible obstacle. No problems with the property, no problems with urban planning, regulations, etc, etc. So, new city? Well, use new land. Even if it's not strictly necessary, it's as simple as that. Anyway, even this is not something new either. The Palm Jumeirah in Dubai, for example, is a similar concept on a much smaller scale though. But having said that, let's get to know this Forest City project a little better. 
And take note, because we are talking about 14 square kilometers of new city on four islands. 300,000 houses, 700,000 inhabitants, 200,000 new jobs, and at least $100 billion of investment. All of this on a 30-year deadline. These are heart attack inducing figures. The idea on paper is to use the special economic zone to replicate the success of Shenzhen. Shenzhen is a Chinese city that we have talked about several times on Visual Politic. It's located just across the border from Hong Kong, and thanks to its status as a special economic zone and the influence of nearby Hong Kong, it went from being a small fishing village to becoming the main technological hub of China. And not only that, Shenzhen is also one of the top Chinese cities with the highest incomes and highest quality of life. Well, the idea in the case of Forest City is to copy that model, taking advantage of the similarities between Singapore and Hong Kong. And take note, because we mean copy in the literal sense. In fact, 66% of the entire consortium promoting it, the so-called Country Garden Pacific View, is owned by the Country Garden Group, one of China's leading real estate developers based in Foshan, Guangdong province, exactly the same province as Shenzhen. So yes, in fact, they are very similar with the story of Shenzhen's development. And then the other 34% is owned by the local company Esplanade Danga 88. Curiously enough, the Sultan of Johor, Ibrahim Ishmael, owns more than 64% of the shares in this company. Yes, that's right, the Sultan of Johor. Because my friends, Malaysia has one of the strangest political systems on the planet. Nine of the states that make up the federation have their own royal house. So this Ibrahim Ishmael is the Sultan and head of state of Johor. In an upcoming video, we will go into detail about this particular chaos, this puzzle that is the Malaysian political system. In any case, as you can see, no matter how elevated his title, he's not above doing business, even if it's just to throw his weight behind a real estate deal. What a novelty, right? <laughs> But let's continue. The fact is that it is precisely this majority participation of the Chinese company, Country Card and Group, where the controversy over the real purpose of this project arises. Because friends, this project has been openly framed within the well-known One Belt, One Road initiative by which, as you will know, the Chinese president Xi Jinping seeks to expand Chinese influence through million dollar investments in infrastructure or projects like the one we are talking about in this video. In fact, just out of curiosity, if we look more closely at Forest City, at least this this first phase that has already been built, what we find is basically a Chinese city in full force. A Chinese city in the heart of Malaysia and only two kilometers from Singapore. And let's see, not only have around 80% of the apartments sold been brought by Chinese citizens, but also the services and public spaces seem to have been designed with Chinese residents in mind. For example, the only educational institution currently located in Forest City, Shatuk, is St. Mary's Forest City International School, an American school. It offers education in only two languages, English and Mandarin, no Malay. On the other hand, this makes perfect sense because this place is not meant for Malaysians, but as a hub for expats. A small all two-bedroom apartment costs about $170,000, a price that is not affordable for the vast majority of Malaysian workers, not even for those working in Singapore. And pay attention because this is where a whole debate has arisen. A debate about the real sovereignty that underlies this kind of project. Is it right to let a foreign developer build and sell most of a city of almost 1 million people to the Chinese and to do so in the image of Chinese cities without taking into account either the population or the local culture? I invite you to leave your opinion below in the comments. And yes, I am sure that for many of you, the answer will be so clear that even the question of debate will seem preposterous. But the truth is that if you think about it, it is the perfect catalyst for a whole political campaign. The influence of Xi Jinping, Malaysian nationalism, the danger of the Chinese threats, the lack of access for the local population, and so on and so forth. And there we have it, the perfect breeding ground for a pushback political campaign with nationalist overtones. And you know what? That's exactly what's happening, to the extent that it could become one of the main stumbling blocks for this project. The fact is that at the moment, Malaysian politicians have a kind of love-hate relationship with this project. You see, on the one hand, they don't like seeing a Chinese city being built on their territory. But on the other hand, they don't reject the more than $220 million that Malaysia has already received in taxes, fees and licenses thanks to this project. All this money, mind you, when not even a quarter of all the work has been completed. 
But no matter what, despite the huge costs, as I mentioned before, it's the debate on sovereignty that just won't go away. Take a look. Building a huge Chinese city in Malaysia leads to questions about not only our national sovereignty, but the social contract, which will have to be worked out or there will be imbalances. Lin Guan Ong, Malaysia's finance minister. And it's not an isolated opinion. Indeed, these concerns led the previous government, that of Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamed, to eliminate automatic visas for anyone buying a property in Forest City, which was one of its main attractions. In other words, you can now buy an apartment, but not automatically automatically enjoy that property if you are a foreigner. In fact, such was the skepticism of the previous Prime Minister that he went so far as to say that he would prefer that Forest City became a real forest, complete with baboons, monkeys and other exotic bugs living in it. Crazy. But why so many misgivings? Why so much controversy around a project that was born with the aim of becoming an icon of national pride and a first-class economic engine? What future awaits this new megacity that is already under construction? What exactly is driving the interest of the Chinese government? Is there something hidden lurking behind all those imposing towers and the promotional videos that depict this place almost as paradise? Well, listen up. Behind the Scenes Okay, if one thing is clear in this whole story, it is that Forest City exists, and is where it is solely because of the existence of Singapore. The city-state has served in this case, as is almost always the case, as a conduit of investment and capital attraction, not only for the city itself, but also for the region around it, which is much poorer. Because if the plans are completed, Forest City will have a large area of offices and commercial activity, and even its own industrial areas in the near future. Which, who knows, could rival Singapore itself, at least according to the plan. The truth is, however, that the objective of this macro project is not solely healthy competition. Rather, the aim is to bring China's economic tentacles closer to the city-state, a major international economic center. In this way, not only a multitude of Chinese consumers, those with sufficient purchasing power to buy a house there of course, but also tens and tens, hundreds of Chinese companies and thousands of professionals will be able to establish themselves on preferential terms alongside Singapore. In other words, just to be really clear, the main idea behind the Chinese government supporting this initiative is to build a whole Chinese city, a city adapted and focused on the Chinese population and professionals right next to Singapore itself. In fact, the main development company, the Chinese Country Garden, is a company that specializes and practically exclusively in the marketing of real estate spaces among Chinese citizens. This is one of the reasons why investors in Forest City are basically all Chinese. In fact, only a handful of Malaysians, Singaporeans, Indonesians, Koreans, and the occasional Japanese and Hong Kong, among other small nationality groups, have purchased property there. In other words, we're talking about what may, in practice, be a powerful business cluster with which Chinese companies will achieve a privileged situation when doing business in Singapore. Can you imagine that? I don't know. From Chinese schools to lawyers who understand China's legal framework, Forest City has been designed to be a meeting point between professionals living in Singapore and the Chinese market. And if you think about it for a moment, it's a clever way to expand the influence of the Chinese economy. A method, by the way, that is as surprising as it is capitalist. After all, it is based on private investment, profitability, and the premise of generating competitive advantages for their companies. And at the same time, it could become a golden opportunity for Malaysia, a tremendous economic engine to develop the south of the country and turn it into a source of wealth. Of course, it is not all that simple. As far as the problems of sovereignty goes, which, mind you, is not exactly a minor issue, can you imagine? I don't know, the Chinese government coming to claim the sovereignty of a city built inside your borders, in which hundreds and thousands of Chinese citizens live, and which has been built with Chinese capital? And if the track record of Beijing is anything to go by, the concerns don't seem that crazy. Well, to this political issue, we can add other concerns that always, always crop up with this type of project. For example, the complaints of the local population about the impact that this city could have on the fishing sector, the main economic activity supporting residents today. As we have already told you, Forest City is being built on four reclaimed islands. It is located next to the mouth of the Pulai River, where the mangrove forest reserve of the Pulai River is located. Well, due to the change in the tidal dynamics that this new artificial coast generates, many experts think that a part of these protected mangroves could disappear. Similarly, the area's native fauna could also be affected, as the 30 different species of algae that provide the natural habitat of dugongs and sea turtles, both endangered species, could be affected. 
On top of the environmental doubts, we must now add the doubts about the economic viability of the project in the short and medium term due to, well, you know, the effects of the coronavirus. Before coronavirus, the sales showroom was always crowded and sales were very positive. Even some phases were already sold out, but since March, sales have dropped over 90% and typically there are no visitors. Member of the Forest City sales team for Nikkei Asian Review. And of course, given the circumstances, the big question is now, will the project go ahead as it was intended? Or will it simply remain one of those numerous, large, doomed real estate projects that have been built with Chinese capital in various locations? So there you have it. With this video, we will wanted to present one of the most ingenious ways in which Xi Jinping's One Belt, One Road program aims to extend the tentacles of the economic and financial fabric of China. But having given you the rundown, now it's your turn. What do you think of this whole Forest City macro project? So I really hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit like if you did, and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos. Don't forget to check out our friends at the Reconsider Media podcast. They provided the vocals in this episode that were not mine. Also, this channel is possible because of Patreon and our patrons on that platform. Please consider joining them and supporting our mission of providing independent political coverage. And as always, I'll see you in the next video. And if you want to learn more about politics and hear even more of my lovely voice, you can join us at Reconsider Media. We have a podcast at reconsidermedia.com slash podcast. See you there.